day to walk in the garden. I'm Liz Davey and you're walking, watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. This series of garden and cooking shows is being filmed at my home here in Norfolk. I'm starting out as usual in the herb garden and I have already started doing a little fall cleanup. It's mid to late September. It's the third week in September actually and we can start doing a little cleanup. We don't expect a frost until probably the 1st of October at the very earliest. However, I'm starting to watch the weather forecast and we are having some cold nights down into the 40s already. So we know it's going to come eventually. We can be frost free up until the 1st of November. So you just have to watch the forecast and plan accordingly. But I can already start to cut some things down. I cut down the oregano. There are still bits of it at the base of the plant, which I could pick to use fresh. But the longer stalks that had gone to seed, I did cut. Uh, oregano will seed exuberantly throughout your garden. And I really didn't want too much more oregano in this garden. In fact, next spring I'll probably cut it back a bit and take out some plants to share. There are annuals in this garden, and of course, with the first frost, they will go. The lemon verbena is very tender, and with the frost, it will completely turn black. So we want to use that. Uh, next to be cut back will probably be the lemon balm and the lime balm, because they too will go to seed throughout the garden. There's still mint to use, which is unusual. We've had rain up until the last couple weeks. Anything that you do want to continue going, you need to keep watered now, any of the annual herbs that you want to keep, keep going, and that would be the lemon verbena primarily. I've taken the rosemary and the bay plants around to the back of the house. It's a little warmer back there because there's a cement, uh, brick patio, and it's near the house, a little sheltered area. So they will uh, survive actually until about 20 degrees but I thought it would be good to get them there so they can be watered and cared for before they come in the house. We'll look at those later. It's time to take down birdhouses. You can get a little start on the fall, fall things by uh, taking down your birdhouses now. And one of these is eclipsed. I think we can get it down. There we go. This one has a screw on the front. Most birdhouses that are really meant for birds, some birdhouses are purely decorative, but if they're meant for birds, they usually have a way to clean them. And I do recommend, as you go to clean them, that you wear a mask and gloves. Birds can carry some rather nasty funguses and viruses. And so before you undo that birdhouse, just put on the mask and gloves and then discard them when you're finished with your birdhouses. I take a day and go around and do all the birdhouses that are not coming inside and the ones that are. This birdhouse will be in the shed for the winter and go up next spring. Several of my birdhouses are in permanent locations and I'll try to keep those open. Mice have a habit of invading the birdhouses for the winter. I really don't want mouse nests in my birdhouses. So I will try to keep an open door on them if they have a little door for clean out and that will help keep the mice out. Now let's move over to the perennial garden. Perennial garden hasn't changed much in the last two weeks. We have some chrysanthemums coming. The one thing that is different is the boltonia, which is the daisy-like plant in back. And boltonia is uh, often misnamed as an aster. Uh, it is not an aster, but it looks like one, so it makes a nice fall plant. This is an aster, a variety of aster, and it has, will have little purple blooms. Eupatorium chocolate is budded, and uh, the name kind of defines the foliage, which is kind of a dark color, so it will have uh, little white blossoms on it also. 
so we'll have some white. We have grasses in the background. And still to come would be the asters. And they're fully budded, and I'd hope they'd be out by today, but they aren't. The boltonia can be cut back soon, but in the meantime, I will take the seeds from the pods and save those. Probably donate a few to the seed library at the Norfolk Public Library. Boltonia australis is a native plant. And so if you're trying to grow a native plant, it is a good one. And it does grow from seed, though it takes a couple years to reach this size. But these little pods all contain seeds. The pods have uh, been somewhat decorative as they dried, but now it's time to take out the seeds and further dry them in the house to make sure they're fully dry. So we'll have uh, take that into the house later after we've collected a few more seeds. Then I can pop them into the little envelopes that the library provides and share them with others. Goldenrod is a I have a little in the garden. There's a lot more in the fields in the area. It does not cause allergies. Uh, it's a bad press it, that it has, that it does cause allergies. It does not. And it also makes a very decent cut flower. It uh, adds a nice bright yellow. So if you're cutting bouquets and you have a little goldenrod, either on the edge of your property or even in your garden, be sure to pick some for a bouquet. You may not want to let it go to seed, if you don't want a lot of goldenrod, because it too will seed itself quite well. These are the asters. This is a pink one, and this side is starting to come out as the sun hits it today. It's fully loaded with buds. It's hard to see, but it is loaded, and it will be a solid little block of pink in the garden, and others in the garden are blue. So we have pink ones and blue ones, and it's a pretty easy care plant most years, as long as it gets the moisture that it needs and the rabbits don't find it delectable. Uh, last year, a lot of mine got pruned back by rabbits. This year, the rabbits have gone for the vegetables instead of the flowers. So I have flowers at least, but we've lost quite a few vegetables to rabbit damage. Next year, we will be revamping the fencing system to helpfully uh, eliminate them in both areas. We still have a few roses coming, and again, I will not, usually I will would uh, cut back the roses, but this time I will not be cutting it back. We want them to say, it's time to go to sleep. And by not cutting, deadheading the blooms, it'll form little rose hips. It's already done that on some of the other roses, and that tells it it's time. Pretty soon it will be winter. They will winter over better if they don't have a lot of new foliage and new bloom. I'm making a lot of lists as to what I want to do next year. Uh, if, for a gardener, there's always next year, which is kind of nice. You're not stuck with the same garden every year. Every year is a little bit different, and you can change things around too. Now is a good time to add some perennials. Uh, there are a lot of them on sale at the nurseries. You just have to make sure that you water them thoroughly and make sure that they're hardy in your area. You may want to mulch them too in order to keep them through till spring. It's also time you can divide some of the perennials and move them to other areas. I generally wait till spring on a lot of mine simply because I have other things to do in the fall like cleaning up leaves and other and uh, cutting back plants. But many people find fall a very good time to divide their perennials. Now let's move over to the vegetable garden and there's a little more to do there. I do plant some uh, flowers around my vegetable garden and in it, mostly annual flowers. And these are dahlias that we started. Back in the spring, I dug in the tubers that I had saved all winter. I will be repeating that process. 
Once frost hits, the beautiful dahlias will be just a black clump of mush. They are very sensitive to a frost. Until then, I'm using them and drying them in bouquets, sharing them with people, and cutting off any, I will deadhead these, cutting off any spent blooms. I think this is one. And uh, as we cut off the spent blooms, we get more. The more you cut with dahlias, the more you get. So keep cutting them back, cutting them for bouquets, and enjoy them until they're gone. After a frost, and the foliage has darkened, I can cut it off and then dig the tubers and store them for the winter. I'm also going to be cutting, to, digging today, the amaryllis that I put out in the garden to form roots. And I want to dry this a little bit and I'll dig it up and put it in the shed. We should have some nice roots need to get under it without hitting rocks. This is a big bulb. If you buy amaryllis, know that you can save them. And you may get blooms the next year, or it may take two years to bloom again. Last year, all five of my amaryllis bulbs had blooms. So this year, I'm not sure what to expect. This will go into my shed, along with the others that are here. And I'll dry those for a while and then repot them in dry soil. I won't start to water them. I'll bring them in the house as the weather gets colder and then start to water them when, uh, well, probably around Christmas time. Some people like amaryllis to bloom at Christmas. I prefer mine to bloom in February when there's nothing else. At Christmas, you have a lot of other decorations, but later on, you really need a little color. So I wait until a little later to start watering them. All of the foliage will die back as they're drying. So they'll be looking just like the ones that you would buy in the bulb store and the nursery. The other ones that will be dug will be the uh, canna lilies. These have uh, red lilies, the larger ones. And we'll dig those and they'll be stored indoors over the winter to be replanted in the spring as well. I have a, a lot of milkweed, kind of a little native garden back, back of the garden. And right now the, the uh, swamp milkweed, which actually doesn't really need a swamp, but it's a beautiful red milkweed and it is going to seed. And it will reseed itself here and there, but I'm going to save some of those. And I just put it in a paper bag and we'll let it dry well. I'll leave the paper bag open inside so that the seeds will dry well. And then you have a little winter project of removing all the fluff from the seeds. It does take a little time, but it's good to wait until you have that time more in the winter and the fluff can stay with them as long as you like. It's interesting how the uh, fluffy part of the seed actually propels it and sends it on its way, like little helicopters. But each one produces quite a lot of seed. This is uh, also something you can do with butterfly weed and regular milkweed, just the uh, normal one. You can go out, if you don't have milkweed for the monarchs, you can probably find some in a field near you and take a few seeds and then we can start them in the early spring. I'm in the uh, vegetable garden and I've started cleaning up after things have gone by, you don't have to wait for a frost. The squash plants were finished for the year. They were not bearing anymore. The cucumber is getting there. We still have a few cu cucumbers to pick. And the beans are finished too. Uh, they're looking pretty bad. So what I'll do is just 
pick these and compost them. Just pull them up. And compost. We may have a few beans left on them. If they're small enough, I'll pick them to use. But for the most part, they're finished. We still have a few herbs to pick, basil, uh, definitely parsley, a lot of parsley. And I'll be storing some of that for the winter. Don't dig up your parsley in the fall. If you've planted it from seed this spring, leave it in the garden. It will continue to produce for a very long time. It's quite cold sensitive. And it will come up next spring and give you early parsley before it goes to seed. Parsley is a biennial. It has a two-year life cycle. So be sure to leave it in your garden. Other things you can definitely pull. They will not be coming back. Dill and fennel will reseed themselves, as will cilantro. You'll notice I have a lot of uh, cloths over my wires. And I have some fall things in there, a little lettuce, a little kale, and some chard. I don't know if it will grow enough to produce anything. We don't get as much sun these days, but this will keep the rabbits away and also give it a little bit of protection from the weather. So I'm hoping we can get a few winter greens from it. I still have arugula that can be picked, and of course I'm uh, harvesting the herbs. And we have tomatillos, which are still maturing, and a few tomatoes. Once the tomato vine is gone and there are no more blossoms, they too can be pulled. This one has pretty much finished, so I will go ahead and pull that out, give myself a little more room. I have a whole lot of nasturtiums down here, and they are edible flowers. Not only are they pretty, they're also uh, purported to make the tomatoes sweeter. I don't know if that's true or not, but I planted them near the tomatoes just in case. And my cherry tomato is continuing to produce heavily. One cherry tomato in the garden can give you all the cherry tomatoes you really need. So I've this year been focusing on some of the recipes to use those cherry tomatoes. I also have a few more yellow tomatoes that I've been picking, and some of those have been trying to drop on the ground. If you can catch it right away and the tomato still has some green, not quite ripe, you can bring them inside to ripen. The same is true as if a frost is threatening and you have green tomatoes that are starting to show a little color. You can definitely bring them inside and they will ripen. Do not refrigerate tomatoes. Uh, it ruins the flavor. You want to use them fresh and not refrigerate them unless you've cut them up. If you've cut them up, then they need to go in the refrigerator. But before that, they do not. But we're getting plenty of tomatoes of various types and we'll continue to do so until the first frost, albeit a little slower. Now let's go around and look at the cuttings. I'm still taking cuttings. This time I'm going to work on some geraniums and again you want to take the end of the stalk of the geranium with a few leaves and cut it. Actually, these grew from last year's cuttings. But we'll uh, pull a few of the leaves and use some of the rooting powder. All of the geraniums I had out this year grew from last year's cuttings. This is a pink one, so I'm going to want to make sure I find a tag and write pink on it so I'll know that I have the cuttings from a pink geranium. And then I just use a pencil to make a hole and snug it in around it. And I had watered this soil this morning. This is compost. You can also use potting soil. Compost will feed it a little bit. And I can get probably, uh, here's another cutting, another one, and another one. I can get four or five cuttings off of one plant and that will make four or five new plants for next year. It's really quite uh, amazing. And then the original plant itself, once cut back, will form new foliage. So you can really have a lot of geraniums just from one plant. Instead of just pitching them into the compost or into the uh, trash bag, 
Take some cuttings, put them in a sunny window, and you may have geraniums blooming in about March, maybe even a little earlier. I have uh, also some scented geraniums, and I'll do the same thing with those. So we'll have a cutting tray of geraniums. These are the ones that we took before, and it looks like most all of them have rooted. I did a few of the scented geraniums here, and uh, we have a few weeds because I did use compost. It is not weed free, but uh, I want to make sure that I keep these well watered. And then about next month, where I've put uh, two or three cuttings in a pot, I'll want to move two of them out of that pot and into another one. I will end up with four or five different trays of cuttings. I do have some plant lights and I do have some sunny areas where I can put these for the winter and kind of alternate putting them under the plant lights. They will be ready next spring to fill my planters. All of these plants, except this one, came from cuttings and this one was a canna that I had saved the bulb. So I spent no money on this planter and we still have a, a full planter with uh, quite a few blooms in it. I'm sorry, I did spend some money. I bought a heliotrope, which is the blue plant, and also a celosa, which is the red one in the background. Adds a little color, extra color. But you can really save a lot on your planters if you do take some cuttings in the fall. Now I want to plant a new perennial that I purchased over the weekend. This plant is a Jacob's Ladder, and uh, I'm going to put it right here. It will have a blue flower, bluish purple flower, or purplish blue, I guess doesn't make much difference. And I thought it would go very nicely with the lavender that's here, and also the bright pink. Of this uh, pink, or dianthus, which has a, a bright pink flower. It's only got one or two flowers on it now, but it should come back up. The Jacob's Ladder is a native, little native plant, again, and it likes sun to part shade. And this is a very nice cutting that someone made and planted or dug from around their own plant. I'm going to smooth this in. And then water it. And I want to be sure to keep this watered well. It has quite a few roots, but they were in the pot, and we want to make sure those roots extend out into the soil before it really gets cold and the ground freezes solid. My little tags tell me that I have tulips planted here and also some hyacinths. This plant will come up early and it blooms fairly early as well. At least that's our hope. But I will keep that one watered well and any more that I decide I want to plant or move. Again, you need to be aware of keeping them well watered into the fall. This is true of evergreens that you already have if you, we have a very dry fall. You want to make sure they're hydrated. Also young trees, two and three year old trees, still need a lot of water. Uh, they haven't spread out as much. And shrubs, this is a shrub I planted in the spring. And that too, I will make sure I give a nice drink. It bloomed this spring. It's called New Jersey Tea. Again, it is a native, possibly a little further south from us. Pretty trouble-free, as native plants are. But we want to make sure we keep anything that's new this year watered well. If you put in a whole new garden, you'll be, need to be out watering it quite a lot. Now, let's go around back. Okay. Uh, in the shade garden, I, it's a matter of just kind of starting to neaten up a little bit. Some of the hostas have gotten uh, kind of bent down and 
starting to brown around the edges, you can cut them off, uh, get started with the plan to make things a little neater. This is a bleeding heart, and it's well done for the season. Many of them will die back even earlier. This year we had enough rain, they stayed up, but it's time now to cut this back and compost it. It's been a healthy plant and it will be back up again next spring with its pretty little red bleeding hearts. This too is a native plant in this form. The shorter ones are not native necessarily but this one is, and again, is pretty carefree. I have several of them, and since they do often go to seed, I may have more that come up automatically. I'll be on the lookout for those and put them in other places. I started with one, now I have three or four, and I may have five or six by the time I'm finished. They do like it in the shade, and it looks much better to get it out of there at this point. The hostas, again, the leaves, some of them are pretty well riddled with holes. And you can add them too. Eventually they'll go. I like to remove my hosta leaves. Some people leave them. They will eventually just kind of melt down. But uh, I like to keep the area around the hosta a little free so that the slugs don't make a winter home there. Now let's head back for the pond. We'll be needing to get that ready for winter too. My pond is filled with tropical plants and so within the next month they'll need to be moved inside uh, so that we can try to keep them over the winter. I have some success with them. Often they limp along. I kind of put them in a back corner because they aren't too beautiful. But as long as I can keep them alive, they will come back and be very showy in the summer. Tropical plants for ponds are reasonably expensive, so if you can keep them over, it uh, bodes well for next season's garden expenses. I have my net ready to go on the pond. I've stored it over the uh, summer um, and winter too. This will go over the pond. I'm seeing a few leaves start to fall. As they start to fall more towards early October, we'll be sure to net the pond. I have to leave a little spot. We have a nice little frog down here and I don't want him to get stuck in the pond. Uh, so I want to leave a nice little area for the frogs to get in and out. Uh, but I do want to keep it covered so that the leaves don't go as much in the pond. You can't avoid having some green matter go in the pond and it will disintegrate or you can also use a net to scrape it out in the spring or even in the fall a little bit. The fish are going to stay all winter, but uh, we'll net it, take the plants out and net it for a while and leave the filter and the waterfall running just to have the water purified and cleared on at least the nicer days of fall. I do want to hook the uh, thermometer into the pond and we'll leave Mr. Frog alone and put it over here along a plant. We want to watch the temperature of the pond and once the water temperature drops to about 60, 55, 60, I will start using fall and winter food which is easier for the fish to digest. Once it drops lower than 50 on a regular basis this will fluctuate as our weather fluctuates in the fall. But once it really drops off, then I stop feeding the fish altogether. And they go into their winter mode of kind of semi-hibernation. Uh, almost a suspended animation as they slowly move through the cold water under the ice. But we continue to feed them now. And a little more on warmer days, a little less on cool days. Continue watering plants. Uh, these are annuals, and again, once the frost hits, these will be gone. I don't bother with uh, taking cuttings of impatience, though I suppose it is possible. They tend to be a little fussy inside, 
but I will collect the seeds. And uh, here is one of the seed packets ready to pop, and inside the seeds can be saved, dried, and I'll have enough probably for next summer's impatience from seeds that I collect this year from these plants. If you want to be picky and only collect from certain colors, if you have mixed colors, you can go ahead and do that. I'm not sure if they'll come true or not because I think these are hybrids. Hybrids will not come true from seed, so I don't even bother selecting colors. I just uh, select seeds. I do have a fuchsia here, and I love fuchsias, and I will probably try to bring this one inside for the winter. I have not had great luck. They tend to attract insects, and they just don't seem to grow as well indoors. But it is a lovely plant. I may also try some cuttings this year and see if maybe that works a little better, that we can get some fuchsias next year from cuttings. There's so many things to try, and by taking cuttings and saving seeds, you really have nothing to lose. If they don't grow, you're not out much, and if they do grow, you're way ahead of the game in the garden for next year. Getting my bird feeders ready. Right now, the birds have lots of seeds and pods and uh, all kinds of things to eat, so they may not be visiting feeders if you have them out as much. Uh, I will be putting them out as the weather gets colder and the plant material and seeds and berries are no longer available. Usually I start putting it out about the time the hanging plant dies, which is where I put my feeder. That's a good indication. Uh, once the plant's gone, the feeder goes up. We can continue Again, feeding them. We'll give them a little food today. And I want to continue using deer spray uh, periodically. I'm not using it as often these days, but if you start to see a little uh, damage, it's time. I don't uh, worry too much about the hosta right now because they're on their way out. What I do worry about are things like the hollies, some rhododendrons, and some of the other uh, perennial plants that they might start to chew on and you want to discourage them from coming into the yard for the winter and working on your evergreens and other plants. They do like holly oddly enough with the spiky leaves I would think that would be a very unappealing meal for the deer but they will eat them so I will make sure I keep those sprayed at this season. Now let's go up near the house. I'm starting to stage plants to come in the house for the winter. Uh, this is an oxalis or shamrock plant. It is not hardy. I have several in the house. It makes a lovely house plant for the winter and it's been out enjoying the summer but it will be ready to come in soon. I have my bay, bay leaf plant which needs to be trimmed back a little bit and a rosemary and those will be coming inside. I've put them here so I can keep them watered and keep an eye on them. Uh, when it's time to bring them in, again, the bay and the rosemary can wait until the temperature drops almost to 20 degrees. This one needs to come in when it approaches 30. I've grown hot peppers here this year, and this one really took off. Uh, I started by planting a uh, package of mixed hot pepper seeds, and uh, this area seems to be a good spot for them. There's one out in the vegetable garden that isn't doing as well, but where I have the brick patio and the windows, the sun really comes down on these on a sunny day, and they've been loving it. So we have lots of hot peppers in with the flowers, and I think I'll do it again next year. I've got another one that's smaller up here. It has a lot of little buds on it, and even a few little red hot peppers. I have a feeling that one's very hot. These are not as bad. But we'll see what we have. We've got four different kinds, and it's kind of fun to try some different things once in a while. I've also gotten my saucers ready to come in. I have a lot of plant saucers that will go under the plants as they're brought in, so you want to make sure you get them ready now. Uh, usually, and I'm no exception, there's a mad scramble the night before they predict a frost of getting everything inside. So the more ready you are to get these things done, 
the easier that mad scramble will be, especially if you had other things planned for that day. This is a bougainvillea, and it's come in every winter. I think I've had it for over 20 years now. And it will need to be cut back a bit because otherwise it won't fit through the door. So we'll be doing that as well. It always seems to put on a lovely flush of bloom just about the time it's time to come inside. And then once it gets inside, like most plants, it will drop a few leaves. I have a couple other plants. Again, I'm deciding what to bring in. You can't bring in everything. Certain things don't do too well. I do cuttings of coleus because the large coleus plants really don't do that well inside for very long. So by taking cuttings, I can feel a little bit better about just composting the plants as they go by. Now let's go in and do some cooking with some of the things that we've been able to gather from the garden. A lot of things going on in the kitchen as well as the garden. I'm trying to use up some of the produce that's in the garden before it's gone and also trying to preserve a little of it for the winter. Uh, today I'm going to start out with the product that I don't raise but is now in season and that's apples and I'm making some apple oatmeal cookies. And I've tried this recipe before and it really makes a nice soft oatmeal cookie which I've always had a hard time making. Many times my oatmeal cookies come out a little bit too crisp, but the apples really help. I'm starting out with one and three quarters cups butter and one and one quarter cup of brown sugar. And I'm gonna mix those together and cream them in the mixer. And then I want to add one quarter cup of milk and one and a half teaspoons of vanilla and one egg. And I'll mix that until it's combined well. And now I'll mix in the dry ingredients. And I'm going to start with two and three quarters cups of oatmeal. And my original recipe called for quick oats, but I kind of like the old-fashioned ones, so that's what I use. And one and one quarter cups of flour. And then some seasoning and leavening. We have a teaspoon of cinnamon, a half teaspoon of nutmeg, a quarter teaspoon of salt, a half teaspoon of salt, and one quarter teaspoon of baking soda. And we'll mix that in. And add two chopped apples. I peeled the apples and chopped them. So they've been peeled and chopped. And I'm going to stir those in by hand. I did add a little uh, lemon juice to help prevent browning but they, because I did chop them a little in advance. With all the oats and apples, these are a little healthier than some other cookies, though they do have the brown sugar. And then I want to drop them onto my parchment coated baking sheet and I'll just use two spoons to drop some tablespoon sized pieces. I'll do some more of these later but I'll put these in a 350 oven for about 11 minutes, 11 to 12 minutes. It's always best, ovens vary so always go a little short on the time and then you can always add time, but if they start to burn, it's a little too late. Now the next thing I want to make, while those are baking, we'll start our main dish, which is a Dutch baby. And a Dutch baby, I have no idea how it got its name. Uh, I should look it up sometime. It's usually a dessert, but this one is a savory dish. It's an oven pancake, kind of like a popover in many ways, the batter. And usually it has a little sweetness and fruit is put on top and then whipped cream. 
However, for the savory version, we're going to use vegetables instead. But we're still going to use kind of the same popover type batter with savory seasonings. The first thing I'm going to do, I put two tablespoons of oil into my cast iron skillet, and I'm putting that into a 425 degree oven. Actually, it's best if you put the skillet in the oven and then turn it on. You want that skillet really hot when you put the Dutch baby into the oven. This is what helps it puff up. I'm going to start by mixing three eggs. Then we'll add a half cup of flour, a half cup of milk, half teaspoon each of salt and pepper, and I'm going to mix that well. Some lumps are okay, a few. And then I'll add a half cup of chopped spinach. We're going to use more spinach on top of it. Okay, we've mixed the, in the spinach. And now I'm going to go over to the oven. And I've got the hot skillet. I want it really hot. Yes, it's hot. You can see the steam. And I want to pour the batter into the hot pan. Sorry for my back, but... It will start cooking almost immediately. We'll spread it out if it hasn't gone all the way over to the edge. And then close the oven and set the timer for 20 minutes. And let our Dutch baby cook. And while it's cooking, for five minutes, I can put in some cherry tomatoes, which have been washed, and then uh, a little bit of... Uh, Salt and pepper and garlic and olive oil. And I'm going to put these in for five minutes. Same oven. Just to roast them a bit. And then while those things are cooking, we can start making some soup. I'm making a roasted tomato basil soup. And in the interests of time, I already roasted the tomatoes. And I'm using yellow tomatoes. My recipe calls for... Two and, uh, one and an eighth pounds of uh, Roma tomatoes, which are the paste tomatoes, and one, about three quarters of a pound of cherry tomatoes. However, I had a lot of medium-sized yellow tomatoes, and so I decided to use those. I cut them in half, sprinkled them with salt and pepper and olive oil, and roasted them in the oven for about 35 minutes. At that point, after they cooled a little bit, I took the skins off. I didn't really want skins in the soup. I still have some seeds, but I really didn't want the skins. So I'm going to add those to my saucepan. And we're also going to add, at the same time, four cloves of garlic were roasted, so they're nice and soft. The garlic and onion are in, and I'll add two cups of vegetable broth. And one cup of basil leaves. This will be a garlic basil soup, and we want to bring that to a boil and then simmer it for 20 minutes. While our soup's simmering, we're going to do a little uh, preserving. I have lots and lots of parsley, two different kinds. And this is, I have washed and have drained. It's not completely dry, but it's getting there. And one way to save it is simply to 
pull some of the stems and with the curled parsley, I like that for garnishes as much as anything, although it's, it can be cut up and used in cooking as well. And I'm going to just add that to a glass jar. It's important to use a glass jar and I'm having uh, the moisture that's on it, which is just a little bit of moisture, stay with it as it goes into the jar. And we can pack the jar quite full. It will go in the refrigerator and it will keep up to several months this way. And I'll keep uh, adding it and hopefully have parsley to use through Thanksgiving. That's my goal at least. You can keep picking it. But this uh, goes in and it has a plastic lid. You don't want plastic to touch it. Uh, especially you don't want to use a plastic jar, a glass jar, and uh, then keep it away from the plastic. Somehow that seems to make it deteriorate faster, so we use glass. That's an important thing. The other way of saving it is to just put it in a plastic bag and freeze it. Now this is not going to be good for garnishes because the minute you take it out it's going to be all wilty. And you can even use the stems in this. But this is parsley that you can add to soups and sauces and other dishes down the line all winter. And what I want to do is pack it firmly into the bag. And what I, my plan is to make a little sausage shaped roll at the bottom of the bag. And once it's frozen, it will get quite hard and really pack it in. And then you can just take out the whole little sausage and cut off a piece to put in your soup or stew. And we want to roll this tightly. And seal it. Seal out the air. And probably put a couple of rubber bands around it. I have a few of those in here. and a label as well. I think everybody has a junk drawer with their rubber bands and other things like that. And this will go in the freezer and the parsley will stay frozen and you can cut it off as you need it. Again, only to be used in cooked items. I mentioned earlier that nasturtiums were edible, and they are. Uh, they can be eaten in salads, they can be used as a garnish, certainly, but you can also make some uh, hors d'oeuvres out of them and stuff them. You can stuff them with either sweet or savory, and I have mixed some cream cheese with some toasted walnuts and raisins, and I'm going to use the leaves and just put some on probably one edge would be better and make a little roll and if you wish you can tie one of the flowers around it hopefully the stems are and I don't think they're going to be quite as pliable enough to tie at this point this one came off. Let me have one that is a younger one. At any rate, you can uh, serve them with a flower. We'll make another one. Tying doesn't seem to be possible at this point. They're probably a little brittle. But just the inside of the leaf. You can also use a savory mixture, and one of the recipes recommended using a tuna, tuna salad mixture that was rather a stiff tuna mixture with parsley, tuna, capers, and a little mayonnaise to hold it together. So that would make a savory version. Let's try an orange one. Or you can stuff the flowers. You want to make sure that you've washed them. Of course, that's true of the leaves as well. 
And you can just put a teaspoon of filling in each of the flowers, either sweet or savory. The seeds of the nasturtiums have also been used. And there are recipes for pickling the seeds, and they are a substitute for capers. Also, I read that during World War II, pepper was very expensive and hard to find, I guess. And they used the dried nasturtium seeds, which had been ground up, as a pepper substitute. Nasturtiums do have a peppery flavor, so it makes sense that they would use that as a pepper substitute when they couldn't afford the pepper that was available and it wasn't totally available since the plants used for peppers are generally grown in other areas that were being used for other things. So some things that you can do with nasturtiums and uh, make an interesting hors d'oeuvre of, of sorts. Now let's make a frosting for the cookies that we baked earlier. Since these are caramel apple cookies, we want a caramel apple frosting. And I seem to have lost my tablespoon, so I'll get another one. To a half cup of confectioner's sugar, I'm going to add two tablespoons of ice cream sundae sauce and approximately a tablespoon of milk. You can add more or less as necessary. The idea is to make a glaze for the cookies. And then you can use a, either a spoon or a pastry bag to kind of drizzle this on the cookies. Once they have cooled completely, and so these are caramel apple cookies, and I'm going to put these just here, and we have some on a plate as well, which I will glaze. If you plan to keep these over, don't glaze them until you're ready to serve them, because they do get a little sticky. But they will freeze just fine without being glazed. And there we have some on a plate as well. And now well, let's get ready for our Dutch baby to come out of the oven. I'm going to take the uh, tomatoes out, and it's puffing up in there. I don't know if we, the camera can see it or not. I want to close it fairly quick, but it is puffed up, and it has probably five to six more minutes. And our tomatoes are nice, and, and we need something else to put it on. We're going to serve these on top, but right now they're just nice and, uh, and roasted. Our garlic's been roasted too. And we're just uh, going to wait. And while we're waiting, I'll cook some spinach. And this is the perpetual spinach, and that's what I used in the Dutch Baby. And I'm just going to microwave it until it wilts. That's all really you need to do to cook it. And that'll be about four minutes. And just the water that's on it from being washed will be enough to nicely cook it. Okay, the Dutch ba our Dutch baby has been in the oven for 20 minutes. I hear the timer. And look at that. It puffed right up. So now I'm going to add a half cup of cheddar cheese on top. and put it back into the oven for five minutes. And the spinach is ready. Spinach really cooks down when you microwave it. As you can see. And these are things we'll use to finish our spinach Dutch baby. The soup is cooking along nicely, and it should be about 
20 minutes in another five. Our Dutch baby has been in now for almost five minutes. Cheese is nice and melted. And I'm going to put it on a trivet. It's quite hot. Be careful of the frying pan. And now we'll finish it by adding our cooked spinach. Actually, it's a little drier than usual. I'm going to spread that out a little bit. I may have to use my fingers a bit. You could use frozen chopped spinach or frozen spinach if you wished, if you didn't have it in the garden. But we add some spinach. And then our roasted tomatoes go on top of that. With all their nice juices, they form kind of a sauce, and garlicky. And the idea is that each serving gets some of the spinach and some of the tomatoes. If you uh, prefer not to have a vegetarian meal, you can also add some chopped bacon to this. And we have soup to finish. I'm going to use the immersion blender with it and blend it up. A regular blender or food processor could also be used. Some of the basil got caught, possibly. And we can serve that in a bowl. I wasn't sure how our color would be. We have some flecks of basil in our yellow soup. Let me turn it off at this point. And just to add a little color, I want to swirl in a little bit of red tomato sauce. I've made some tomato sauce to freeze, and I just want to serve a little bit of that on the soup just to add some color. A little garnish. You could also garnish it with some fresh basil if you wished. So we have our meal of a Dutch baby, some tomato and roasted tomato, basil soup, and apple, caramel apple cookies, and a few nasturtium treats. And I'm going to move my flowers over as well because we're enjoying those on the table. And we've also been able to put a few things away for the winter, mostly the parsley. And we could also freeze the soup and the cookies for later. Again, if you freeze the cookies, put on the frosting right before you serve them. That concludes my show today. And I hope you'll join me again in the garden and in the kitchen next month when we'll really be getting ready for fall at that point. Thanks for joining me. I'm Liz Davey. This has been a walk in the garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable.